OK, we yeah. are good to go. Fantastic. Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, depending where in the world you happen to be sitting. Thank you so much for joining us um, this afternoon on this webinar. We Connect International has again got together with Procter & Gamble in South Africa, and we're doing the fourth of the five webinars that we've agreed to do for this year. So it's really, really exciting. My name is Jean Chawapiwa. I'm the country director for We Connect International. Very, very honored to be on this platform again, speaking to you, the audience, and um, with our great speakers. So for today's session, uh, we're looking at the importance of marketing, especially marketing strategies in the changing world. As the world changes, the consumers are changing and their buying habits are changing. And I love the quote that says, good marketing makes the company look smart, but great marketing makes the customer look smart. And our customers are getting smarter and smarter all the time. I'm now going to hand you over to the Procter & Gamble experts who are with us this afternoon. And straight over to you, Mikael, um, to take us into the webinar. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Jean. Hi, everyone. My name is Mikhail. I manage um, purchasing at Procter & Gamble and also work on um, citizenship or corporate citizenship and uh, partnerships uh, with WeConnect. And really great to be part of this initiative with WeConnect and doing it for the second year in a row and um, hope, hoping you know it all goes smoothly again and uh, we can do it again next year. But with that, I'll hand over to Moniki, who's going to be taking us through the more, uh, marketing web webinar today. Over to you. Thank you very much, Mikhail. Hi, everybody. My name is Evanson Moniki. I work for Proton Gamble. I am currently the Femke brand director, but transitioning to be the sub Southern Africa uh, brand transition leader. I'm based in Johannesburg, South Africa. It is a privilege to be with you today. Uh, well, I'll be talking to you uh, and actually more of uh, coordinating a discussion uh, uh, between us uh, when it comes to marketing in these times. Um, for today, I have a couple of things uh, that I'd like us to take us uh, through. The first one, of course, I'll start by introducing myself. I'd like us to also demystify uh, marketing uh, a bit. I'll also be touching on marketing in uncertain times, as well as how we can also grow our businesses in a changing consumer landscape. We'll then finish off uh, with a bit of tips and tricks when it comes uh, to, to, to marketing and still growing our businesses, despite the, the, you know, the changing times, and so what we can execute starting today, immediately after the webinar, what can we do to already start impacting change? Throughout the uh, webinar, we're going to have a couple of stops where we you'll have an opportunity to share your questions. So Mikal will be our coordinator in that sense. So at any point in time, please feel free to, 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 to drop your questions. Uh, Without much further ado, I'll start by introducing myself. Um, I, as as Jin mentioned, my name is Evanson Maniki. I consider myself a PNG lifer, but first of all, uh, I must say I am Kenyan. I'm proudly Kenyan. Uh, I am a father of one, uh, a husband of one, a family and friend to many. Uh, I consider myself to be very passionate about brand building. I'm also very passionate about, about music. To this end, uh, I DJ a bit whenever I can. Um, I also have a deep passion for Arsenal Football Club. It has become a very torturous uh, period of, in my life, especially the last 13 years, but we, we soldier on. Um, as well, uh, I, I, I have recently dedicated my life uh, to making the world a better place for neurodiverse individuals. Uh, and this is a journey that I'm currently on and I'm really proud to be to, to be on this one and to continue learning and how I can I can I can help to this end. I've been in PNG for 12 years, uh, none of which uh, uh, have been spent um, in, in Kenya uh, and now coming up to about three now here in South Africa. I started off in brand, uh, sorry, in uh, logistics, <laughs> apologies. Um, I spent three years in uh, the logistics uh, part of our business, working on uh, distributors, also did a bit of planning. Then I made the career choice to move on to marketing, uh, which, has, which was my passion because I had a, a, a degree in marketing. 
uh, but um, it's something that I've always wanted to do. So I've worked out of uh, um, Kenya and South Africa, I've worked on some of the biggest brands we have, uh, both in PNG and in some cases in the industry, some of the biggest in the world. So I've worked on Pampers, I've worked on Femcare, both in Kenya uh, as well as here in South Africa. Uh, I work on the Always business uh, as well. I've had the opportunity to work to, to work across uh, different brands as well. Uh, so I've worked on big brands such as Ariel, I've worked uh, on Gillette, I've worked on Safeguard, I've worked on, um, you know, today we'll also have brands such as Haircare as well here. So I've worked on multiple brands across most of Sub-Saharan Africa, including South Africa, uh, Ghana and other big parts of the world. So I am extremely proud to be a PNG lifer and, um, and that's me. Great. So getting into the discussion for today, I'd like to start with the question, what is marketing, right? And um, I do appreciate that most of us, are, some of us are from different backgrounds as well, but I think it's important to first of all ground ourselves in what marketing is. Now, looking at what the dictionary defines marketing is, there are various definitions uh, of this, but I think the first one talks about marketing being a job that involves encouraging people to buy a product or service, right? To some extent, this is correct, but if you look at a different uh, a definition of the same, which is basically marketing being work of advertising and offering goods or services for sale, you start to get a different feel of what marketing is, right? But for me, I came across this definition, which for me is extremely holistic in terms of what marketing is, at least from my point of view. And in it, uh, you know, the, the, the Cambridge Dictionary defines it as the business activity that involves finding out what customers want, using that information to design products and services and selling them effectively. For me, this encompasses what marketing actually is. In my view, marketing is holistic, right? Marketing is end to end. Great marketing puts the customer at the center of everything that the business is doing. In my view as well, marketing is the driving engine for the organization. And I do hope in case there are people who have a different point of view, uh, at the end of this webinar, you will agree with me and we'll all hold hands and agree that um, marketing and the customer should be at the center of, 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 of the organization. Now I'll need to give a small caveat. I will be using the word consumer and customer interchangeably. But for me, it means the same thing. In many industries, the, uh, the customer could be a business or the person buying the product. Uh, for us, we use consumers because the products, people who buy actually use the product. So whenever I use consumer customer, I'm using it interchangeably for purposes of our, of our discussion. So I'll start, first of all, by asking this question. Who is the most important person in your business? And feel free to, 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 to leave uh, um, uh, your answer in the chat section. And Mikhail, please let me know if there are any answers coming in and uh, you, you can shout out in case there are any questions coming in. But I did pose this question to a couple of business owners that I know back home in Kenya. I also posed it to a couple of um, C-suit ex executives in some of the companies that I know. And I asked the same question, who is the most important person in your business? So Mikhail, I don't know whether you've gotten any reactions uh, on, on the chat sections, anything that probably you, you can share before we keep going? So so we do have one saying, uh, the employees are the most impo uh, important person in their business. Uh -huh, uh -huh, that's a good one, the employees. I was expecting answers like, um, if you're a self, uh, if self-employed, if you're, you're an entrepreneur, you'd say, I as the business owner, I'm the most important person of the, uh, in the business. Any, any any other uh, charts coming in? Well, as hey, we, uh, mm -hmm. sorry, Monique, there are a few uh, with the customers or the clients, and there's a few people with uh, that response. Okay, great, great. So, I, I, I for the person who said the employees are important, I think that's a good um, um, point of view. But I, I want to side with the people who say that the customer is the most important person in their business. And this rhymes and resonates with some of the answers I was getting from some, some of the people I spoke to before this webinar. And for me, as we start to look at how important the customer is, is to introduce the concept of customer centricity. 
customer centricity or simply the customer at the center of everything that the organization is doing is the heartbeat of great marketing. Great marketing centers around the customer. Great marketing is 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 uh, is is starting with the customer first, putting the customer first, and then working backwards. So everything needs to resonate around the customer. And since marketing deals with the the, the consumers and the marketers, I, I saw I came across this quote and I said I have to put it. And I said marketing is too important to be left to the marketing department alone, right? So to this end. I think it's very important that we 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 agree that all departments, everything within the organization, needs to center around the customer, right? And in and if this is the case, then the people dealing who are who are the frontline workers, uh, uh, if uh, you know as it were, and if it's the marketing marketing department, it means that the customer and the people working around the customer needs to be at the center of everything that the organization is doing. So in case this is not the case for your organization today, I urge you that at the end of this webinar to please take a couple of steps back and review with your organization and to ensure that you put the customer first and everything, all priorities, everything needs to be with the customer at the center. As we continue to have our discussion, I'd like us to take a minute to just look at organizations that were customer centric. And I put up a couple of examples. If you look at Amazon in the in in, um, in which is an American company, everything Amazon does starts with the customer. If you look at all the innovation from from same day shipping to 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 free shipping to Amazon Prime, right to the how they organize their ratings and reviews, everything about Amazon is about pleasing the customer. And to this end, it is no surprise that the company still continues to grow. I believe this, um, if we look at Q1 of this year, the stock grew by about $1,000, right? Simply because they continue to please the customers and they're very successful. Another example is TikTok. I don't know how many of you are on TikTok, but I recently made the mistake of going onto TikTok. But TikTok prides itself in designing the algorithm with the consumer at the center of it. Without even sign up, TikTok learns what you like by the looking at what videos do you watch, how long do you watch them, when do you skip, and it quickly creates a repertoire of content that is tailor-made for you. This is without even sign up, right? And it is no surprise that TikTok is now among the fastest social media companies in the world. Netflix is another example. Netflix started off as a DVD delivery system that uh, came about when customers were not happy with late fees uh, where, where, uh, from you know when they were borrowing cassettes of uh, from the video library so they created a, a mail-in system where they send dvds but they didn't stop there with the advent of the internet and on-demand video netflix continued to evolve to continue serving the customer and now move to a streaming service the best uh, and the biggest streaming service we have They've also now started catering to the different regions with uh, uh, local content. I was very happy to watch a local uh, a comedy uh, movie um, just recently uh, with my wife. And it's just testament to how Netflix has been able to tailor make your viewing to the consumers based on region now. It is no surprise. It is the biggest, the biggest and by far and most uh, uh, streaming service we have in the world. In contrast, we do have organizations or, or, or companies who are not doing so well, right? The story of Sony uh, and the Walkman is, is, is quite interesting because while they moved fast to create the first portable cassette player to, 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 to cater to the needs of the customers, it stopped there. They were hardware first and forgot about the software part on when it comes to music. And this did not go down well because they missed the DVD wave, uh, sorry, the, 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 the CD wave uh, when CD uh, became a thing. And on top, they missed when, move, when music went to MP3 format. So people like Apple who moved from iPod to Apple Music and now people like Spotify came in and rendered their business uh, uh, null and void. BlackBerry, I don't know how many people are old enough to have owned a BlackBerry like myself. Um, BlackBerry came in and revolutionized um, email on the go. They catered to the uh, 
market that is, let's call it businessmen or, and businesswomen. But with the changing times and the advent and the increase in mobile phone penetration, touch screens became the new norm. Consumers wanted touch screens, but they prided themselves in having their, their aquatic entire, you know, the aquatic keyboard, their physical keyboard, and they wanted to continue and to hold on to what they knew and to hold on to the, a few million customers that they, that they had. In doing so, they missed the boat on billions of consumers, especially young consumers, who are coming into the category. And that's how Apple and all the other uh, uh, phones came in. Now BlackBerry is not a phone company anymore. It's, they now bring software uh, uh, protection. And of course, we all know about Kodak. It might surprise some of you that Kodak, while they were known for their physical cameras and their film technology, were the first ones to actually uh, create a digital camera, right? I, I was shocked the first time I learned about this one. And if you look at Kodak itself, there's a famous quote by Steve Sasson. Steve Sasson was the engineer who actually developed the first digital camera for Kodak. He presented it to management and management said, and I love this quote, that's so cute, but please don't tell anybody about it. We all know how that story ended, right? Because they were making so much money from film, they did not adapt to what customers were saying, what consumers were doing, and Kodak is not the same company anymore, anymore right? So you should not probably, in case you're not convinced, right? Uh, and you should not, we don't want to take my word for it. I think it's important we look at what the gurus in the industries have said about cons uh, customer and consumer centricity. We've looked at the story of Amazon, and you can see Jeff Bezos talking about the importance of customers in this famous quote that we got. Somebody like John Mackey, who was a, a, a CEO of Whole Foods, is also saying the same thing and looking at the different stakeholders within the organization and picking out customers as being the most important part of their business. I love this quote by Gene Buckley, and he said it best. He said, don't try to tell the customer what he wants. If you want to be smart, you can be smart in the shower, then get out, go to work and serve the customer. Of course, uh, 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 it's, it's, it's a bit on the lighter side, but it captures customer centricity uh, at its best. The CEO of, of, of Walmart, Sam Walton, also said it very well and picked out customers and consumers being the reason why uh, the, the, the organization exists. And of course, we cannot talk about customer centricity if we don't talk about this man. So Steve Jobs was, uh, of course, founder uh, of, of, of Apple. And throughout the Apple story, he, he famously said that you need to start with the customer experience first and then work backwards. And if you look at what he's been able to do with some of the technologies is to actually um, be able to be ahead of the game and create technologies ahead of even uh, consumer ones and serving the consumers better than even they themselves would have imagined. So I want to stop there for a couple of seconds to see if there are any questions before we can move on to the middle part of the of the discussion. Mikal, any any questions coming in? So I think we can give everyone a few minutes to um, send through their questions in the chat if, if anyone does have any. But I think one interesting comment that did come through, Moniki, was actually disagreeing with one of your previous points on um, who is the most important person in your business. And I think this one is um, it's it's subjective when you look at what importance actually um, or what area you're looking at importance or what kind of output measure whether it's a sales um, increase or a um, brand reputational building and things like that but um, one of the points like I said that disagreed with it was that the people and the employees are the most important person because at the end of the day they are the ones that create the value that the customer needs. Absolutely and I must agree with each each part of the organization being extremely important. I, and I'm not saying employees are not important. Everybody in the organization is extremely important. I'll give an example. In very many restaurants uh, that I've visited, you find that the first person that interacts with you might even not even be as like these the, the main staff of the of, of the organization. It might be a security guard, right? 
So in this instance, and if you talk about first impressions, suddenly this security guard becomes a very important part of your experience. So my point is that while everybody is extremely important, very important, and we should put them in place, my view is that the consumer, the customer, is the, the whole reason why the organization exists. You might have an excellent team of, um, uh, of, of employees, you, the most motivated, they are really happy to be there, giving their best, but if they do not have customers to serve, or if they're not serving the customer well, I, I, I do put it to you that that organization is, is a bit shortly, but I'm, I'm happy to have that uh, conversation separately as well. Great. Uh, yes. Mikhail, any any questions coming in or should we move on? I think we can move on and if any come in, we can uh, touch on them in the next uh, stop we have for questions. Great. And thank you for, for, for the participation, guys. So I think we can move on to the next section. Now, I really wanted to share with you guys some top five things or top five trends that we have seen um, when it comes to the whole COVID-19 situation. Uh, I think well, it's any we, we, anyone's guess is as good as mine, but I we, I feel like we're between the middle to the end of the crisis. We hope so, touch wood. But what we've always done as PNG is we've always tried to stay in touch with what's happening in the market. Now, what I've done is I've taken um, our own internal research that we've done. Probably we have a research happening we uh, every week, and now we moved it from week to month during the COVID-19 crisis. And I've also looked at some of the key trends that we are seeing within the industry, both in South Africa, and also looked at some of the other trends in Sub-Saharan Africa. And all of them have converged to five key themes that are trends during the COVID-19 uh, um, situation and what it means for businesses. I think the first thing is the legal landscape, right? What we saw with the legal landscape, starting from day one where we, we went, we, went, we moved to level five, is we saw a lot of bans and a lot of restrictions, that were changing how businesses operate and were changing how consumers actually um, um, uh, react. The first thing when we saw the announcement of the lockdown was a stockpiling, right? Everybody went and stockpiled, other people stockpiled tissue paper, other people stockpiled food, but that was a key change. And I remember as part, uh, uh, what also happened was that we found some key commodities being out of stock as well. With the changing legal landscape, we saw some uh, uh, elements of life also be quote unquote banned. For example, alcohol and tobacco was banned. With that, we also saw a bit of ban and restrictions on restaurants and bars. With this, we had big industries that are fully affected and in terms of how uh, uh, people were reacting. So suddenly, there's a restriction on things like movement, things on leisure. So the changing legal landscape really changed what consumers were actually doing and what they were consuming and what businesses were able to do. The other trend that we saw was there was an increased downtime that consumers also faced. We saw that with combination of lockdown and companies also uh, implementing work from home strategies, many, many consumers had a lot of time on their hands. Some of them um, also had were the misfortune of being laid off and suddenly you had so much time on, on your hands. So with this, we saw a massive upsurge in uh, 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 online content consumption. And I mentioned before what happened to Netflix. But with that, we also saw that consumers were spending a lot of more time and things that were not a thing were becoming a thing. For example, online shopping before the, uh, uh, the COVID-19 crisis was 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 let me call it moderate and growing in a moderate fashion but we saw a massive spike in online shopping um, as well we saw a massive spike as well in terms of um, social media consumption and what people are doing on social tiktok grew immensely uh, during this time and also the growth of new habits so diy was a big thing gaming became a very big thing um, as well the third thing was that uh, with the health risks that were uh, accompanying the COVID-19 uh, crisis, uh, we saw a big change in shopping habits. One of the things we picked up in one of our reports is that very many shoppers wanted to spend less time in the store. This meant that they were not accessing the full store and they wanted to go in and buy very few things very quickly and leave. So we saw that on top of this, some of them reduced their shopping uh, uh, trips. They used to go to the stores probably four or five times a, uh, um, uh, in a month. They decided to only go and shop once. 
this was a big shift to, in terms of how to predict when uh, uh, shoppers are going to come in. And with that as well, we saw that uh, some segments ex completely exploded. Suddenly hygiene um, and, med and, and, and medical uh, uh, um, segments around, let's say, cough and cold, suddenly uh, uh, you know, exploded uh, uh, um, as part of uh, the health risks that came. The other thing that we saw was the economy itself. I think with the lockdown and less economic activity, we saw some people losing their jobs. In some instances, households losing two to three members of their families, uh, 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 not having jobs. We saw a contraction in um, the disposable income, and we saw that that also impacted what consumers were buying. Some segments suddenly became um, luxury items. So beauty products, grooming products were not seen as a thing. Right. So why must I, for example, buy something expensive for my hair or for my for myself, yet I'm not going to leave the house. So on top, we also saw that many people were looking for deals. So in many instances, the bigger sizes in, uh, attracted a bigger discount. And we saw very many consumers going for bigger sizes to enjoy the discount so that they are able to spend less ultimately. This was a bit of a shift. Uh, we did not expect this coming in because you'd expect people to down tier or downsize and buy smaller sizes, but we found they were buying bigger sizes and, and, and going for the deals. The last thing we saw, um, again, uh, it's, it's uh, let me say the last thing of the top five that I actually put together was the growth of social causes. I know we saw, especially in America, the height of COVID-19, the Black Lives Matter movement becoming a big thing. Um, and I think closer home, we also saw that, um, for example, the younger consumers were getting more and more involved in social causes. It could, one of our two hypotheses is because of the time that they were spending online, they were educating themselves. Recently, we actually ran a promotion on one of our brands. And one of the feedback that we got from the younger consumers who were aged uh, 18 to 24, yeah, that was the age group, they said that it would have been great that if part of the promotion went back to communities or consumers who were less fortunate. This was this was this was mind opening for all of us. And in fact, there's a study with that also we came across that says that younger consumers and this was a South African study that younger consumers were more likely to buy a brand if the brand not only met their needs, but also gave back to a social cause. So. This trend, I think, is very key for us as business people as we look at what's happening during the COVID-19 period, that we need to ensure that we stay in touch with what's happening and anticipate some of these changes uh, um, um, as well. As we get into it, COVID-19 greatly benefited a lot of businesses. Some of the businesses benefited inherently by their business model. I'll give an example of, say, Zulzi. Zulzi is an online app company that um, does on, does shopping for you. So you go on the app, you buy the elements, they go to the store, and then they bring the elements, uh, to, uh, you know, or you know, they bring the shopping to your to your house. I personally switched to to this. I found it to be extremely convenient. We were not comfortable to go to the stores for a large number of times, and it just worked perfectly. I believe Zulzi grew immensely during the COVID nineteen period. Same thing to Uber Eats. Suddenly. Restaurants are closed. You want to eat something from a restaurant? Uber Eats is 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 the way to go. So a delivery or of of or takeout delivery grew immensely. Zoom became a fantastically huge, huge, huge necessity for 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 everybody, both from a business point of view as well as from a personal point of view to stay in touch. I know in places like in Kenya where court proceedings were now happening in Zoom because they did not want to have uh, in person interaction. With the growth of online um, uh, content came YouTube, right? YouTube inherently was built for for views and content, but with with the, with with now more downtime and COVID nineteen and restrictions, YouTube viewership exploded, right? So many companies, and these are some just some examples, benefited greatly inherently by how they were uh, uh, set up. However, some of them struggled to cope. In a very big way, if you look at sub, right, um, you find that with the lockdown and the ban on alcohol in South Africa, so the business model completely falls apart. Um, in so uh, you cannot buy alcohol for offsite consumption or sit down, and suddenly your business model 
completely doesn't work. Uh, Assad told was on flight center as well, right? Uh, we all know about Edgars uh, uh, and also the the, the 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 problem with Kulula. So for Edgars, suddenly with COVID nineteen, fashion and, sh and and clothes are not a big thing, are not a priority, and suddenly a struggling business has is is put in a very precarious uh, uh, situation. Kulula, the same thing, whereby travel is not permitted and becomes a problem to move around, right? But I'd want to spend a bit more time on a couple of companies that I picked out that had very inspirational stories who are able to adapt to the new normal. The first one is Bottles. So now, if you don't know Bottles, uh, Bottles is uh, uh, a company that uh, you buy alcohol online and they're able to bring it to your house. They're an online uh, alcohol delivery company. Uh, and it's funny that the first thing that I was inducted to when I came to South Africa, of course, was shown where the office is and everything. Then I was shown, OK, this is bottles. This is where you can get your alcohol, right? Now, they, during COVID, they changed their, their business model completely because alcohol was banned. And they partnered with Pick and Pay, and bottles was now delivering groceries uh, to stores. They had the business model. They had the people. They had the technical know-how. And the app pick and pay did it, and that much happened. They changed, adapted, and they were able to uh, meet the demand. Checker 6060. Now, everybody talks to me about Checker 6060 now it's as if it's something that's been there for such a long time. I remember exactly 12 months ago, or not, not 12 months, like more than 12 months ago, uh, speaking to the Checkers team. And I was asking, is online shopping a big thing for you? They said, listen, we have an app. But it's not yet. It's not fully functioning when we don't think we'll go live with it just yet. COVID hit this fast track everything and suddenly Checker 66 is among the biggest uh, online uh, shopping apps we have in South Africa. I don't know if you can see this brand um, at the bottom left. It's called the Chess. Um, I actually came across this when I was when I was when I was when I was looking at um, um, a couple of brands online. So the Chess is an non-alcoholic gin. Before COVID, their marketing plan was to go for people who were teetotalers, so you know, just people who don't drink, or people who are trying to stop drinking, or people who want to reduce the amount of alcohol that they take. COVID hit, they completely changed um, the business model, and with the alcohol ban, suddenly they were positioning themselves as the go-to alternative for people who still want to drink gin, but not flout the rules and, of course, not have alcohol in there. A truly inspirational story. That is actually a, a, a company based in Cape Town. Another interesting company I came across was, was Granadilla. So Granadilla is a swimsuit company based in Cape Town, South Africa. Now, when COVID hit, you can guess not too many people are going uh, down to Cape Town and not too many people are going out to the beach and swim. And what happened was they completely changed their, <laughs> their business model and moved from swimsuits to delivering groceries, right? Astounding, right? So uh, very, very um, inspirational story of how during times of adversity, they were able to completely change up their business model. Now, the latest data I have on, 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 on the company, uh, I think they've been able to, to deliver about 20,000 uh, deliveries so far. They have about 8,000 people that they've employed directly and indirectly, and the company continues to grow month on month, right? So very inspirational stories of how companies have been able to adapt to the new normal. I want to take a special mention to a couple of people who uh, uh, adapted quite well during the, the, the lockdown. One is close to my heart, one on the left. This is work that was led by my team uh, on Always. Um, and with the advent of COVID-19 and the lockdown, many of our consumers who we kept in touch with said the biggest thing they miss is the gym. They're not able to go to the gym, right? And coupled with this, we saw that our liners segment was also no, not doing as well because liners was being seen as a luxury product as opposed to sanitary pads. So what we decided to do is to create a program which is on free online gym sessions uh, called Always Stay Home, Stay Fit. And we partnered with a couple of celebrities to create uh, to drive fitness on Instagram Live. We're on Instagram Live and Facebook Live. So this was a huge hit. In some cases, we were getting 20,000 people logged in at the same time for the sessions, and consumers loved it. 
I can tell you that our equity after we've done this execution has grown immensely because of being very close and ad adapting to what started out as a problem and creating something that was a very meaningful interaction for the consumer. Being a DJ, I must also uh, mention a couple of DJs. Now, with gigs being closed, it was impossible to have uh, any interactions. Many DJs went online and were doing live sets uh, um, online. Many of them went as far as creating cash apps, so they were able to get money in as well. And uh, people are doing Zoom parties uh, at home as well. So the agility to stay close to the consumer despite the changing environment is something that I think was, 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 was pretty noble. Lastly, I'd like to um, share with you a model that I put together. I don't know if it's a thing or it's not a thing, but I'll take you through and if it's a thing, maybe somebody can talk to me about patenting it. But I was looking at how did businesses really adapt to the COVID-19 uh, crisis and those who did well, how did they do it, right? So looking at all the companies we discussed and more, for me, I picked up that it started with, first of all, a focus on the consumer, right? And the focus on the consumer allowed these businesses to either anticipate consumer need, right, which led to business growth, or in cases where they were not able to anticipate the need, they were able to adapt to the changing consumer need, right? And both of these things led them to sustaining their business growth despite the disruption that they saw in the market. On top, I look at Cast, uh, uh, businesses that have been able to do this throughout time. I looked at businesses in the 1920s uh, who went through the Great Depression. I looked at companies in 2008 where who, through, who went through the American, actually not American, just a whole global financial crisis. And companies who were able to withstand all those shocks, right, had one thing in common, where they're able to iterate this model over and over again, whereby there's a threat to, to, to business growth Yes, they go back to focusing on the consumer. And when they do this, they're able to adapt. They're able to, to anticipate and to keep in touch with the consumer to ensure that they are continuing to, to grow. So for me, looking at the consumer and the customer centricity for me is key so that we are able to sustain growth uh, despite the changing uh, uh, landscape that businesses face. So at this time, I'd like to again pause for any questions before we move to the last part of uh, my presentation. Mikal, do we have any questions? Great, Moniki, we do have some. And um, if anyone else has any other questions, I see a long one just actually came through now. But uh, if anyone else has questions, please send them through and we can touch on them quickly. Um, the first one, Moniki, is to your point on um, the feedback that PNG received from the campaign you mentioned. Um, how has PNG responded to that feedback on benefits actually reaching the communities? Got it. Um, so on this one, we are busy ramping up uh, two programs. So we have two programs that we run. We have our Always Keeping Girls in School program, and we've got the Always School program proper. The Always Keeping Girls in School program is looking at disadvantaged girls and uh, girls in impoverished uh, uh, backgrounds. And so far, our plan uh, is reaching about 20,000 girls in South Africa, where we're giving them free uh, uh, sanitary pads for up to six uh, months. Okay. Now, in response to this, we actually on top got uh, during during COVID-19, we partnered with other organizations, the Ministry of Women, and we were able to give more donations. I think we were able to give up to five half a million uh, pads while we don't we were able to donate. And on top, we are busy uh, talking to the Ministry of uh, Department of Women to see how we can ramp up this uh, program for always keeping girls uh, in school. We're looking, can we double, can we triple, can we do more, right? Um, if you look at what we've also done with customers, uh, we have a big program coming up uh, with, with, with this camp shortly. Uh, we're partnering with them uh, on, on their program in June and July, where we're also donating funds uh, to, to, to uh, impoverished girls. On top, we have our school program, which has been on hold. With that program, we are reaching 300,000 to 350,000 girls in South African schools every single year. So we are busy seeing how we are able to do that virtually um, starting July. So we put in place, we've been talking to schools, we're talking to the ministries, and we're looking at how we can be ready as of July to 
restart this program and reach the 300 to 350,000 girls that we, you know, you know, that we've been doing. So a lot um, is coming, and we continue to be committed to, uh, um, uh, um, you know, give the best to the girls. Great, Moniki. And um, I think one of the questions came up because you mentioned the experience in markets outside of South Africa. And the uh, question was any examples of Nigerian brands that had thrived during the COVID period? You did touch on um, some of the South African brands that um, thrive, but so I'm not sure if you know off the top of your head anything you can um, talk on that one. I'm not off the top of my head. I'm happy to to, to share some examples uh, separately. I, I I I conveniently focused on the South African brands. I'm happy to share some Nigerian brands, but I'm sure knowing the landscape in Nigeria, I, I definitely know there are a million and one brands who have been able to 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 uh, you know to thrive. So I'm happy to share some examples separately. Great and. Um... We have a very interesting question and it's something that I'd like to unpack with you because I think it's um, a discussion you and I have personally had recently as well. And um, so I'm, it's a bit of a long one, so I'm actually going to try summarizing it um, a bit, but it basically uh, talks on um, marketing being very crucial and almost a um, important aspect for business survival and adapting to changing environments, uh, regardless of what industry your company may be in. But um, recently when COVID-19 hit, uh, we saw a very big cut of marketing budgets across industries. And um, so the first question there actually is, uh, how do we, since um, marketing is such a crucial part in business survival, how do we explain this big cut of marketing budgets across industries? Mm -hmm. um, further to that and building on that one, um, how come it, during any kind of economic downturn, marketing budgets are usually the first one to be cut. And is the spend actually seen as a luxury versus a necessity for businesses? And um, this, this is why I think it's a very, very interesting question, Moniki, and, um, and well, I'll let you unpack that. <laughs> good, 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 Mikhail. I, I love that question. Thank you so much for that question. Look, I think it's, it's a reality. Um, when, when, when when things don't go right, the marketing budget is the first one to go. Now, in my own experience, historically, it, this has been because the people close to the marketing budgets have not been able to create a one-to-one -one relationship between the marketing spend and business growth and growth in sales, right? Other departments have been much better doing this. Now, cheekily, I can say it's, it is easier. When you go for the sales call, when you come back with your order, it's easier for you to, to justify this because it's something that you can see, right? So the reality is, and this is still a discussion we still have internally at PNG, is how do we as marketers ensure that the overall business is understanding the return on investment on the marketing dollars that we're actually putting in as well? The reality is many of the things that we invest in are long term. You are not going to put, in, put a, an ad on TV today and get a sale tomorrow that you can directly attribute it, right? We have very long statistical models to, 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 to be able to understand this, right? As opposed to a promotion that you can do a promotion today and, and see the results tomorrow. But in, inherently, my thing is with everything that we do, we as marketers need to show the long term ROI of this. Unfortunately, it is during these times that we are able to see what this does to the business. So if you cut marketing spend during this time, it may not hit you today. It may not hit you in three months, but six months, 12 months down the line, when you're wondering why is it that new users don't know my brand? Why is that new users don't think my brand is great? Why is that new users or users or customers do not know why my business should be something that they should choose, right? My thing, and I'm, 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 I'm coming to that in just a minute, is when this happens as well, we, I think we all need to make choices across the business, right? I, I, I'm sure we need to, 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 to always, you know, ensure that we're driving efficiencies across, especially during these tough times. When that happens, I feel you should actually not look at, let me cut budget, but how can I make the marketing dollar work harder for me, right? So if I was reaching 100 consumers with a dollar, how can I reach 300, 400, 500? 
So efficiency, rather, uh, or instead of entertaining a cut discussion, let's cut this money today, I think we'd rather use that time to discuss how can we make this money work better for us. In many instances, and Mikali know this, we might end up saying, listen, I can do the same with less, or I can do much more with the same. But I don't think we should be entertaining a discussion of, no, the money is gone. I think it's more we should be driving an ROI and an efficiency discussion during this time. So that's a good question, and I wish you had more time to, to unpack it a bit. Uh, and uh, I'm hoping uh, in the next couple of slides, I can also shed a bit more light on my thoughts on this one. Great, and Moniki, you know, I'm very passionate about this um, discussion as well. It's, uh, it's always a... Um, hot topic when it comes to um, looking at marketing budgets. And I think um, one of the points you referred to there, it's, it's almost, um, it's like the Hail Mary of marketing. If you can directly tie a certain marketing campaign to a certain um, sales output or a uh, brand reputation output, it, um, I think it's something every marketer wants to know. But uh, like you said, it's um, playing a bit more of the long game that um, putting a campaign out there doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have X percentage of new users in the next um, month or even year or so. But I think there's an aspect of it as well of um, brand building. And uh, when you build something, you have to ment maintain it as well. So that maintaining that brand as well, that marketing um, budget and um, plan does go to that maintenance as well. Absolutely. And I think mm -hmm. one more, um, sorry, one more to touch on before we can proceed. Um, and that is what percentage of, or I think this would be more of a ballpark question um, instead of looking at a direct or absolute percentage, but um, what sort of average, average percentage of revenue should be in a marketing budget for a particular small business? <laughs> that, that's a wonderful question, but I'd like to park it. You know why? Because when I, I look at, if you look at marketing as the center of what the organization does, you could consider a lot of the things you do as marketing. Marketing is just not putting a TV ad or putting the money on Facebook right marketing is literally uh, going in and understanding and creating a business model that is going to delight the consumer right so already i want to debunk this uh, it's, it's not a myth but i want to debunk the thinking that if i take if i take tv radio digital that is marketing spend and this needs to be a percent of my spend i don't think that's actually the right way to look at it however I would rather look at it, what does it take to really deeply connect with my consumer and ensure that I'm creating products and services that are delighting them, that they enables them to choose me over and over again. That it, the number will be X, right? Then I look at it as how can I ensure that I can make X to be as efficient as possible based on the budget that I have, how much I have to spend, right? And for me, this is a great segue because I want to already create a mindset shift on the marketing spend and how we can actually be more customer centric with very little amount of money, doing very little things and very few things. Um, and that's actually the next couple of slides. So probably I can pause there and we can pick this up right at the end in case um, I need to, 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 to add on it. But it's a brilliant question. I get this all the time. I've always had this question from friends of mine who are in business. It's a brilliant question, but that's how I look at it. So probably, Mikhail, with your, with your permission, I'd like to segue from that question to probably how we can stay close closer to our consumers and debunk this myth that you need to be flush with cash to 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 be able to stay close to the to your consumers and do a better job at marketing. Sure, let's proceed, Moniki. Excellent. So, I did a bit of research uh, to understand how much does it cost to do a consumer research in South Africa, because I was going through. I put myself in the shoes of okay, if I want to stay close to the customer to the consumer. I need to do. I need to understand what the you know what you know what the consumer wants, 
and to do the to understand what the consumer wants and um let me say let me put myself in the shoes of a business owner then i need to do some form of consumer research into, into the segment that i'm looking at now to do that just a bit of google the average amount i need to spend on a consumer research is about 150,000 rand <laughs> that's a huge amount of money right remember this is not a one off cost i would need to run a consumer research for new segments that i'm looking at uh, new times that that if, for example pre covid during covid after covid uh, different uh, 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 regions so if this is just the cost of doing research just in one bit now i'm here to tell you that we need to move away from the concept of consumer research to being in touch with the consumer right that's a mindset shift that's a mindset shift where we need to move from consumer research to consumer in touch and by being in touch with the consumer that's how we will be able to have the, the the consumer the customer at the center of everything that we do and i'm to tell you that from a budget of 150,000 rand you can actually do this with less than 500 rand 500 bucks guys right and if you don't believe me i'll walk you through it now the next slide i'm going to take you through is a model that we have at png this is a model that we use for consumer centricity or customer centricity, and we call it the consumer love story. Part of that training or part of that module talks about the 21 things you need to do to really stay close with the consumer. What I did was I compressed those 21, which was actually updated to 18, into 11 top items that you should do to stay close with the consumer. And then I costed how much does will it cost for you to do those 11 things to, for you to be really close to your consumer, put the consumer or the customer the, at the center of what you do and really grow your business. And you'll be surprised how much that will cost. So let me take you through it, guys. So I call it the 500 bucks consumer in touch. If it's a thing that will stick, I'm happy to, uh, uh, to patent it as well. But, but let me take you through. So the first thing, guys, why can't we experience our own product, right? Why don't you simply experience your own product the way the consumer would? Now, a caveat, I'm going to take you through from the concept of if I'm doing a consumer in touch for always, as the always uh, brand director, how much would it really cost me? Big company, PNG, must cost me a, a fortune. But I said, okay, you know what? Let me, let me, let me use this concept of, 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 of consumer centricity and I really look at what how much is it going to cost me to stay in touch with the firm care consumer in South Africa. So the first one is if I experience the product as a consumer would, right, always is 23 bucks um, in, 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 in the store. And of course, in promotion, it's going to be cheaper. So already just to experience, if I'm to put myself in the shoes of the consumer, and use my own product, it will cost me 23 bucks. So in your business, if you're in a hotel, maybe go in and sit down and have a meal. See, okay, what is a what, what does the customer see when they when they actually walk in? When they eat, is our food good? Is this part of the food good? Is this great? Right? If you're selling, say, cars, for example, drive one of the cars. Are the cars great? You might pick up very interesting things. Maybe the car is not clean or whatever. Small things, right? So that's the first thing I, I really recommend. Just go and experience your own product as a consumer would. Number two would be visiting, you know, the socials, your own socials. This is free, 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 free consumer feedback, guys. I don't know how many of you have gone to your own businesses the, on Google. Google has got the rating system and it has got the comments in there. You will find a lot of free consumer insights in there. The place was difficult to find. There's no sign. The staff were not clean. Whatever. You're going to find a lot of free things that you can go in there and just understand what, what, what consumers did. Your Facebook page. People will leave comments in there, right? Now, for me, I said uh, from, for Femcare, for me, it cost me like seven rand, right? And that's just for data uh, for my phone to be able to uh, log on to Facebook or, or, or Twitter. 
third one, talking to our employees. This will cost us nothing, right? We already pay them a salary, right? Now, if you talk to employees who are already in your, in, who are using the category, general categories, for example, for me, I would speak to my team who are women using um, any pad, right? It will cost me nothing. Uh, if you're in the restaurant business, um, if you talk to, 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 to your employees who visit restaurants such as yourselves, right? If, if you're in the car business, maybe they drive a different or a competing car. This is free, free consumer insights um, that, 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 that you can actually uh, get into your business. So, so far we're only at 30 bucks, right? And we're getting some good consumer insight. The fourth one is our family and our friends, right? Who are category users. Now, if in the business of fashion, you definitely know um, if you're in men's fashion, for example, and your target audience is 20 to 50, family and friends will be more than willing to talk to you and tell you, no, this trend won't work for me because of one, two, three, four, five. And this for me, I, it's like, for me, I just put myself, it's gonna be 30 bucks, right? If you, if you say you're gonna spend about six bucks on, 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 on airtime or you bring them together and you buy them a, a juice or something, it's cheap. <laughs> That's the point, right? The other thing is to talk to existing customers. You'll be very surprised, especially customers who you consider loyal. They'll be more than willing to give you time to give you candid feedback. What's working, what's not on the product that you're actually uh, offering. Now, that will cost you roughly 150 bucks if you sit them down for a coffee, each of them, or give them a call. It'll be 150 bucks or less if you just sit down with them and ask them, okay, what do you like about my product? What don't you like? What would you like? Right? What am I doing well? What am I not doing well? Are there trends that you're seeing? Right? Visiting places where people in the category are. Now, if you choose places with like high dwell time, you'll be surprised how much consumers are willing to talk to you. I did it myself with the Femcare team in Kenya. We went to salons and we sat down with women. One of the guys uh, in our team knows how to plate hair. So he sat down with one of the ladies and he was just plating hair. And we started talking about uh, uh, you know, the Femcare category. We got, um, we got so much insights. And all you need to do is buy maybe a packet of juice for, for, for a few people. So it's a very great thing to do going to the gym right or even to the bar having a drink with somebody uh, who's in the category you're going to get a lot of free insights why don't we go and buy a competitor's product we learn a lot from our competitors products as, as well it's on the shelf there's nothing wrong that, that we're doing if you buy something like wow this is amazing oh i see why people like it people like it because of x so for me uh, it will cost me 19 bucks because I'm going to buy competitor products. It's about 19 bucks or less. Now, this is a big one. If we observe our customers where they buy, we will learn so much, right? For us, it's at the shelf. I'll give you a very quick example. On our femcare category, we, it, it, uh, we realize that shoppers are spending six seconds on the shelf or less. Six seconds. They are coming in. They're picking their pad and they're leaving. So they know the pad that they use and they know what they want and they leave, right? So for me, this was free uh, um, insights for us. And it was very important that you also do this for your business. You'll get a lot of free uh, 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 insights. Why don't you visit popular socials where your consumers spend a lot of time? You'll be able to pick up trends. You'll be able to pick up what people are doing, what are people saying. You'll anticipate trends as they change. And again, this is like, I put like seven bucks because this is just for airtime, right? Second, last one is what if you spend five hours reading the material that your cost, customers read, you'll be able to pick up trends. Where do they, do they like to go on holiday? What do they like to buy? What's hot, what's not? And the last thing is um, online polls. Today on your Instagram page, it's free to run an, 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 an online poll. And it's simple, you put your uh, uh, like, heart, or, or a dislike. So do you like this? People like, people don't. And it's easy and it's free, it's just data. So my point is with just 500 bucks, because all those things just take exactly 500 uh, bucks, you can get a wealth of consumer uh, 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 knowledge and you should be able to put together a very big case, but also shift from thinking that it is expensive. We've seen that it's not, and you'll be, get a lot of insights. For perspective, when we want to know what's happening with 60 million South Africans, we only need to talk to 2,000. Think about that. Great, 
And uh, with that, I'd just like to quickly recap and wrap up. I'd like to say that marketing is the most important part of your organization. If you don't think so after this, I'm happy to, to, to uh, we can speak separately. We always need to keep the customer at the center of everything that we do. Customer centricity is everything. If you could keep the customer at uh, the center, you will always grow your business. And lastly, you can make your, cast, uh, your business customer centric for only 200 bucks. I used a very big example and it has been for 200 bucks or less, you should, can make your business customer centric today. So that's it uh, from my side. I wanted to check if they, we have time for any questions. I know we are right on time. Or should we wrap up now? Sure, Moniki. I think um, we can hand over to Jean to uh, close out quickly. And if you don't mind staying on for further yes, five to 10 minutes and uh, we can touch on the questions after that. I've got it. I will. Thank you. Uh, Jean, over to you. Hi. Thank you. That was really amazing. Um, it's amazing how the hour goes so fast once um, the clock starts running. Thank you for all of that information. Just to let everybody know that we will share the slides and the recording, um, so please keep a lookout for it. And we will be loading this on the We Connect International YouTube channel as well. Please go and check that channel out. Some of our previous webinars are also already on there. Loved the topic, loved everything about it. There's so much we can interact and talk about. But going back to where I started, great marketing makes the customer feel smart. I think you told us that the customer wants to help to build a better world. I really liked that aspect and how you brought that in. And I think that's so important, all of us. It's not just about purchasing and accumulating things anymore. Every time we make a purchase, we want to feel better about who are we buying from, who's benefiting, what jobs we're creating. So I love that. And then your table at the end about how to make sure that we're in touch with the customer, knowing that the customers all around us was fantastic. So thank you, Procter & Gamble, uh, Mikhail and Emerson for your time. We know you're very busy people, so we really appreciate the commitment that you make to helping to grow the businesses of women business owners across Africa. Thank you for everybody who joined. I know we have people from Lagos as, as far as and other places as well. So thanks, everybody. We will be putting the recording up. Vanessa has put the feedback form on the chat, so please click on it. And it's very quick to fill in. You don't have to fill in every question if you don't want to, but the feedback really helps us to get to know you, the consumer, and what you're interested in. So, Mikhail, I'm going to hand back to you to finish any questions that you may want to go through, and you're welcome to stop 